Uh, I know some of you missed for good reason last week. You were going to Branson, Missouri, and I know that y'all had a great time there. And so uh, I do have session five's sheet. Uh, There's 15 or 20 copies of that in the back. And so if you want to get that, please feel free to do so. We went over interpreting dangers and uh, figures of speech. Uh, like metaphors and similes, hyperbole, irony. Um, We went over that last week. And then effective Bible study questions that you can have every day in your quiet time. I would encourage you to always be asking who, what, when, how, all right, where. And that will help you understand the text. And then questions like, is there a command to obey? Is there a promise to claim? Um, Is there a belief to change? Is there a habit to start? or stop, those type of questions are always very helpful in your quiet time. And so all of that we covered last week in session five. Who needs still needs a uh, second sheet? Uh, all right. Hey, uh, while we're young. I've learned. I wouldn't have said that a year ago, but I've learned from you, brother. I've learned. I've learned. You've 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 affected me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was talking to a guy that went on the trip uh, to Branson, and he said, "Oh, pastor, I can't talk about it. What happens in Branson stays in Branson." I said, "Well, who led the trip? Billy Pruitt." You know. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> No, we appreciate Brother Billy, don't we? He does a great job. Great job. Yes, please, yes. Uh, does everyone have uh, the two sheets now? Everybody got two? All right, so we're going to be looking at session six. And uh, before we do, we do have the video I referenced last week. And uh, it's about seven to eight minutes long. We're just going to watch about 90 seconds of it so you get an idea of, it's called, it's by Bible Project. You can go to YouTube, type in Bible Project in the search, and Ezekiel part two, and it'll bring up the second half of the book of Ezekiel, a summary of it. And uh, we're reading through Ezekiel. We're going to end it, I think, on Tuesday of next week. Um, And so we're at the end now, but it'll be helpful. So we have put these on our website as well. Um, And so you can go to fbcmillington.org and you can find all the books that we're going to be reading from now to the end of Chronological Bible Reading. Okay? And so I would encourage you to watch the video for each book before you read it. So if if it works, we're going to try to show that now and we'll watch about 90 seconds of this. The book of the prophet Ezekiel. In the first video, we were introduced to Ezekiel the priest, and he's sitting among the exiles in Babylon. And he's confronted by the awesome glory of God's temple presence, but it's appearing to him in Babylon. And then Ezekiel discovers why. It's because of Israel's idolatry and injustice that has compelled God to abandon his own temple. And while there is still hope for the future, the book went on to develop Ezekiel's message of divine judgment, first for Israel and then for the nations around Israel. And then a key moment happened in chapter 33. Ezekiel receives a report that the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem is over because the city has fallen. The temple is destroyed. Ezekiel's grim words of warning came true. The exile was the most horrendous catastrophe that ever happened to Israel. And it raised the big questions of whether God was done with Israel for good. But remember, at the end of chapter 11, God promised that there was still a future beyond exile for Israel. And so the rest of the book is designed to explore Ezekiel's vision of hope. First for Israel, then for the nations, and then for all of creation. All right, the hope we'll stop is- it right there. Thank you. So see, right there, it's giving you an outline of what you're going to be reading. So when you're reading chapters 34 through 37, it's talking about the future hope for Israel. When you read 38 and 39, it's talking about the hope for the nations. Well, that's helpful to know, you know, so you don't just sit there and say, well, what in the world's going on, okay? You know what's going on by watching the video. You get a summary of it, and then you read to get the details of the messages, 
All right, so I'm going to let you watch the rest of that at home on your time, but you can go to YouTube and see it. You can go to our website and see it as well, okay? And so uh, just know that. So we're on session six now. So we have learned to observe. Observation is what does the text say? You got to start out with that because sometimes we skip that. Sometimes we read something and say, oh, I didn't mean that. And sometimes it might, sometimes you might be right, and it doesn't mean that. But you start out with what does it say? Then interpretation is what does it mean? Then application is how do I apply it to my life today? Okay? So we are now at session six, so we're going to try to combine all of these. Uh, we're also going to look at a specific word tonight where I'm not going to be teaching the text for 30 minutes like I normally do but we're going to be looking at the text emphasizing a specific part of the message, going to another text that emphasizes it and another text that emphasizes it. So we're going to be in Malachi chapter 1 to start. You can turn there if you wish in your Bible. The scripture will also be on the screen. Malachi chapter 1. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament written about 410 B.C. And uh, so... So know the timing of it. It's about 410 years before Jesus was born. It's also about 1,000 years after Moses was walking the earth, okay? So Malachi chapter 1, verses, verse 1 through 5. Notice the wording. First, we're going to start out with what does it say? The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. And I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says we have been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down and men will call them the wicked territory. And the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. Your eyes will see this and you will say, The Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. So again, this is written in 410, 409 B.C. Now I want to draw attention to the phrase, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Okay? As people read that in their quiet time, they read that Esau was hated by God. That, that seems to be, wait a second, what's going on? I'm confused, okay? And so I hope to give you some information that will help you in interpreting this. Because first, you have to start out with what it says, right? And it clearly says that he hated Esau. Agreed? Okay, that's what it says. Uh, verse 3, but I have hated Esau. All right, so this again is, uh, I mean, Jacob and Esau were twin brothers. You go back to Genesis 25, and you find the story of Jacob and Esau. They lived approximately 700, really 8, 1800, 1900 uh, B.C. Um, some people get that messed up, but Abraham, some say 1800, but probably it was more 2000 B.C. Jacob and Esau were their grandsons of Abraham. You got Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob and Esau, right? And then all of Jacob's sons make up the 12 tribes of Israel. So Jacob and Esau were 17 to 1900 or so B.C. So uh, well over 1,000, probably 1,400, 1,500 years before Malachi writes this, inspired of God. All right? So some truths we need to learn here. One, God never said he hated Esau while Esau was living Okay, nowhere in the Old Testament do you find this statement till now that I hated Esau, okay, the Lord says. Um, second, the hate referred to in Malachi is not simply toward Esau. If you look with me at the beginning of verse 4, you'll find that it says, Though Edom says we have been beaten down, but we will return and build the ruins, thus says the Lord of hosts. Who is Edom? Edom are the descendants of Esau, okay? So Edomites, when you find the word Edomites throughout your Old Testament, 
They are the descendants of Esau. And so Esau is a figurehead for all the Edomites that followed. And Jacob is a figurehead for all the Israelites that followed. All right, notice in verse 1, he says, The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. And those are the descendants of Jacob. Uh, also, back in the time of Moses, you know, 400 plus years after uh, Jacob and Esau, you got Moses and the Israelites are wandering through the wilderness. And in Numbers chapter 20, the Israelites come through the land of Edom. The land of Edom are where the descendants of Esau lived. And they wanted to pass through, and the Edomites would not let them pass through the land, but made them go the long way around. And ever since then, they have been each, each other's throats. From the time of Moses till the time of Malachi, the Edomites and the Israelites were enemies. And if you want to read about the time when the Edomites wouldn't let them cross, that's Numbers 20, verses 14 through 21. If you'd like to look that up later. So now I want to give you a definition of the word hated here. This is by Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary. Um, they're the writers, and if we can put that on the screen there. Hated is not positively hated, but relatively. That is, he did not choose him out to be the object of gratuitous favor as I did Jacob. And you can compare it to some other verses, and that's on your sheet there, I believe. Yes, so you have that. You can look up all those scriptures uh, later tonight if you wish. But what's he saying? We have to notice here there, it's a comparison statement. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. He is comparing two groups, Israel and Edom. Okay? And that's important in interpretation here. Let me give you another definition by Warren Wearsby in his commentary. He writes, God's love for Jacob was so great that in comparison, his actions toward Esau looked like hatred. As an illustration, Jacob loved Rachel so much that his relationship to Leah seemed like hatred. All right, so we have multiple examples. He mentions another one with Rachel and Leah. And so it's a comparison saying, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Now, when you can go to the New Testament, and it's going to change from Hebrew language to Greek language in doing so, but in Romans chapter 9, verse 13, it quotes from Malachi. And it says, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And so that's again a quote from Malachi 1 that we just looked at. Again, in Romans, God is making a comparison. He is revealing that God has chosen Jacob and his descendants, the Israelites, to, as God's chosen people group. God has not shown the same favor to Esau and his descendants, the Edomites. And God has a right to do that. You know, none of us Gentiles get upset that we're not born into Israel, do we? I'm a Gentile, but I'm not offended at all that God chose the Israelites to show his favor and reveal his truth through. And we find that throughout the Old Testament. And so Jacob I loved as a representative. I chose the nation of Israel, not because of any good in them, but because of my own desire. I chose this small nation to be my nation, to be reaching and impacting the world. And so he showed his favor to the Israelites over the Edomites. And we see that all throughout the Old Testament. Uh, many times in, in 1 Samuel, it's uh, not many times, but a couple times, it's, it's uh, the Israelites fighting against another group, like the descendants of Goliath, Right? And those, the descendants of Goliath are not of God's chosen people group. Israel is. And David would lead Israel into battle time and time again. And he was a man after God's own heart. And God shined his favor upon them. And they won battle after battle after battle as God's chosen people group. And so sometimes in the Bible, you need to get this, when it says hate, it means hate. In this, it's a comparison statement. Compared to my love for Israel, I hate the Edomites. It's a comparison statement. Okay? It looks like hate due to how much I love them. I love them less. I don't love the Edomites the same way I love the Israelites. I don't love Esau the same way I love Jacob. 
All right? So now let's go to Luke chapter 14, verse 26. And in this text, it is not talking about Jacob and Esau, but we do find in this New Testament text the word hate once again. Okay? So please understand what I'm saying. There are texts in the Old Testament where it might say the Lord hates, let's just, let me just say this. The Lord hates sin. Let's just say a verse says that. Well, then it means he really hates it. It's not comparing it or the Lord hates uh, murder. Well, he does. You know what I'm saying? But here, when it says Jacob beloved Esau I hated, it's a comparison statement. So that's very key in interpretation. In Luke 14, 26, it is also making a comparison. It doesn't mention Jacob and Esau at all in this text. But notice what it says. If anyone, Jesus is speaking, he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I've been asked about this verse many a times. Pastor, I just got permission to hate my wife. <laughs> Pastor, I just got permission to hate my husband. Pastor, I just got permission to hate my children. You know, Jesus said it. Well, that is what it says, right? Observation. You don't need to say it doesn't say it. Like if anyone ever said to you, does the Bible said, say that you're to hate your, hu your wife and the husband and children and even your own life? You have to say, yes, that's what it says. What does it mean in the context is the interpretation part, okay? So let's get into the interpretation now of what it means. The New Testament word for hate here is maseo. That doesn't mean a whole lot to you, but I'm just trying to point out that it's a Greek word, not a Hebrew word. When we're in Malachi, that was a Hebrew word for hate. Now we're in the New Testament. It's a Greek word for hate. Um, there are other texts of Scripture that say the opposite of Luke 14, 26. And when you have two texts of Scripture that appear to be contradictory, then you've got to figure out what it's saying in its context because the Bible never contradicts itself. Never contradicts itself. Uh, God wrote his word. He is not confused with himself. Okay? So... In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives. In Luke 14, 26, it says, You must hate your wife. How can you do both, men? Well, you have to understand what the word hate means in each context. And that's why I've been saying context, context, context. Read the verses before, read the verses after, uh, time and time again. In Ephesians chapter 5, it truly means, husbands, you are to love your wives, and you are to do it in comparison and in a, in a model just as Jesus loves his church. Okay? That's your, that's your example is Jesus loving his church. That's how you're to love your wife. In Luke 14, 26, he's saying, compared to how much you love me, compared to how much you love the Lord, it is to appear like hate when you try to love anyone else. It's a comparison statement. If you want to love your wife well, love the Lord more. Amen. That's what he's saying. Let me read Luke chapter 14, 26. If anyone does not come to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Well, in order for you to be his disciple, you don't have to literally hate that list of people. You just are called to love them less than you love the Lord. And in the first century, in a, whether it's Old Testament Hebrew culture or New Testament, the Greek language and the Greek culture and the spread of that, both Greek-speaking and Hebrew-speaking people understood the idiom here. That the word hate is a comparison statement meaning loved less. You are to love your children less than you love the Lord. You're to love any human being less than you love the Lord. And if you, you are to do that to be his disciple. So it's a Semitic idiom that the first century reader understood that we in the West here today, uh, 2,000 years later, it's hard for us to get because we don't talk exactly that way. But that was common. In the first century, no one would go home and say, hey, I've got permission to hate you. No one did that. 
Okay, they understood what he was, what Jesus was saying. Any questions? All right, so I've saved all of you from coming to ask me about that verse now. All right. Pastor, it says hate. What's it mean? Well, we know what it says. We know what it means. So how should we apply it to our lives? I just gave that too. We apply it by loving no one as much as we love the Lord. If you want to be a godly husband, love the Lord first and foremost. If you want to be a godly wife, love the Lord first and foremost. And then you'll be the husband and wife God called you to be. Amen? That's the point. All right? So that, that shows up in, um, well, I, I, I did not uh, gather with God's people to worship the Lord because I needed to see a family member. Now, that might just be an action, but you've got to make sure it doesn't reflect a heart where that person, you love them really more than you love the Lord. And so I'm not going to make a judgment because I think sometimes it, it can be either way, Okay. But what I am saying is we ought to always check ourselves, examine ourselves. Why am I putting that above the other? Okay? All right, so now I want you to take the second sheet, and I'd like to go over Bible translations tonight. And then um, God willing, and, and God can change it, of course, but God willing, next week uh, I'm going to get into some really deep, stuff okay so uh come ready for that and to go home with more things to study i really want to talk on the will of god the sovereign will of god the general will of god the specific will of god um and i think you'll you'll find that interesting and i think it will help you interpret the bible as you see the will of god mentioned throughout the bible so if god doesn't change that and nothing happens that keeps me from being here, then that's the intention for next Wednesday night. Let's go now into these Bible translations. Uh, and we have these sheets around the church uh, in the, the holders, but uh, I get asked often about Bibles and Bible translations. So right here, I'm fixing to give you all the information, and I think this is helpful um, as you go through the basic principles of interpreting God's Word. So when choosing a Bible, some are best to be the most accurate to the original um, languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Some are more devotional reading. Some are um, the vocabulary is more simple for, um, for understanding, but might not be as accurate in the wordings, words chosen because it's made so simple. And so notice the second paragraph. The Bible was originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek and has been translated into English and thousands of other languages down through the years. The differences excuse me, in translations vary in reading levels and in style. There are basically four categories for Bible translations. Let me just share with you an example before I move on. In English, there's one word for love. In Greek, there are multiple words for love. There is friendship love, which is... Philo, which is where we get Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, friendship love, brotherly love. Um, you've got the word for romantic, husband-wife love. You've got the word um, agape, which is typically referenced to be more godly, spiritual love. Uh, there are multiple words for love, and so when they're translated from Greek into English, they're all translated into one word, and you and I, simply by reading English, don't know which one is used. But if you read Greek, it wouldn't be the same word. It would be a different word. Okay? And you would know which one. So, some people say, well, when you translate from Greek to English, if you're going to be the most accurate, you've got you to translate that one word into love. But it would be helpful if it said brotherly love. But you know why it doesn't say brotherly love in a lot of translations? Because a bunch of English-speaking, English-reading Christians would say you're adding to the Bible, you just added a word. When actually, 
one word in Greek might exp be best explained with two words in English. Y'all with me? So try not to be too legalistic on, on which ones are okay and which ones not because sometimes I wish, I wish every time I read love in English he would tell me which one it was in the Greek without me having to look it up. Okay? All right, so... Uh, let's go to the four types of translations. First is literal. This is a word-for-word -word translation. It follows the Hebrew or Greek as closely as possible. Therefore, a literal translation will be the most accurate English translation of the original text. So you can look for, for literal. Now, if you'll go down to the middle of your page, you'll notice on the right translation type, I've listed four different translations that would be considered literal translations. The English Standard Version, the New King James, the New American, that's the one I preach from and teach from, and the King James Version. On the left side is the vocabulary of the reading level. Okay, so if you are a King James person, and that is fine, I'm not critical, I'm just saying the English is so old that it's college-level vocabulary. There are words used in the King James we don't use today, and so you, you can't be a fifth grader and read it very well in your reading vocabulary, all right? Um, so now we'll go up to, back up to, under literal, it says balanced, a process in which scholars attempt to mediate between a word-for-word -word approach and a thought-for-thought -thought approach. So if you go back down now, you see Christian Standard Bible is a balanced version of the scripture. They're, they're trying to be very accurate, but if, if, they, if, if they need to add one word and make it two, to make it the right thought with the example I just gave, they're likely going to put in that second word. Y'all with me? Whereas the literal ones will not add brotherly love. They'll just put love because it's one word for one word. Okay. So next is a dynamic equivalent. This is a thought for thought translation that translates biblical words and phrases into clear and contemporary English equivalents. The priority is not on each word as the literal translations are, but on keeping the intended meaning of each phrase of the original text. However, an issue with this type of translation is that in a few instances, the original meaning of the text is not conveyed clearly. So if you look down under the popular translations of dynamic equivalents, you've got the New Century Bible, the New Inter International Reader's Version, God's Word Translation, New Living Translation, New International Version, are all thought for thought, all right? And you see the vocabulary. The, the New International Version became very popular in the 80s. When I was a youth, I memorized many scriptures in NIV. Well, it's not a word for word, it's a thought for thought. So what does that mean? Let me just make up a sentence. Down the road the dog ran. If that's in Greek, then in English he would say, down the road the dog ran, okay? In the NIV, they would say, down the road, the dog ran in Greek and say, the dog ran down the road. Because we say it that way. We say the dog ran down the road rather than down the road, the dog ran. So they put it in easier reading and they put it as, let's keep the same thought and reorder the words to communicate it in the English way. Okay? So that's a thought for thought. That's not word for word. And so sometimes um, you, they might miss apply the thought. So it's not quite as accurate, but it is easier to read. And that's why the New International Version became very popular because it's on a seventh grade reading level. So for, you know, youth, especially in my day, I w I, as an eighth grader, ninth grader, I read the King James and didn't get it. I opened the New International and I didn't know how to study then. I'm just reading. And I, I, I'd get understanding by reading the, the New International as a high schooler. Okay. Uh, next is the paraphrase. These translations are more concerned with clarity than exact wording. They are easy to read but can give the impression that the Bible was written in the 20th century. For example, Psalm 119.105, a lamp in the King James Version and in the New American Standard Version is translated as flashlight in the Living Bible. This is an obvious drawback on this type of translation. It comprises the meaning of the original text, compromises, excuse me. A paraphrase should not be considered even a translation. So you can look back up and you'll see Amplified Bible, the Living Bible, the Message. 
those, those are not even opening a Greek to translate. They're, they're just making it simpler. Okay, they're, they might be reading the Greek, but then they're writing it however they, would, they want to to communicate it. So they're a paraphrase. And so instead of saying, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, the word is a flashlight that lights up my path. And there were no flashlights, obviously, in biblical times. So that's an example. Um, and so that's not, a, that's not a translation. That's certainly not taking one language and taking it to a new language with the same meaning, same word. All right, so I hope that helps you. I preach from the New American, so I'm preaching from a, a literal word-for-word -word, uh, translation. Since I started preaching, that English Standard Version has come out that's on an easier reading schedule, so many, many are choosing that version today. English Standard's a very popular version, okay? Um, let's go to the bottom of the page now. How do you choose which Bible's right for you? These three guidelines will help you make an informed decision. How accurate is it to the original languages? For study, you want, for study, you want to use a dependable, accurate translation. How easy is it to read? Do you need a dictionary to read it because of all the sophisticated words? Or is it easy to read that it insults your intelligence? Too easy. For a prolific reader, the comprehension is not a factor, but for a child, the vocabulary can be overwhelming. And then third, what, are, what helps are in it? You know, are there references, cross-references to other verses? Are there the maps in it, concordances, footnotes, things of that nature that you like about that Bible? So all those things are things you take into consideration as you're choosing what Bible uh, to use. All right? I would not encourage you to use one of those paraphrases if you're trying to study uh, the Bible. Okay? That's just, that's like me taking the Bible and rewording it. Um, to help you understand it maybe. And so it can be helpful, but it loses the authority of being God's word. Okay? All right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, Holman's no longer making it. And it's slightly different, but the Holman Christian standard of like five years ago, yeah, I think it's under balanced. And the Christian standard is slightly different, but those would be the closest two to each other. They're both balanced category. But I, my understanding is Holman's, Holman's out. So Christian standards may, uh, separate from Holman now in the ones printed. Good question. Any others? Oh, wow. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, but what you just read, it's clearly in the paraphrase category, by the way I'm defining them. Balanced would still be a translation. It wouldn't be adding all those adjectives. A balanced is, the balance is between word and thought of the Greek and Hebrew, not, not adding additional adjectives for emphasis on, on the way the sheet is defining it. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, I'm, I'm in seminary as a 25-year-old, and they're having us um, pick it for preaching class. You're going to preach from this. Um, the same reason pastors um, that are in their 70s and 80s all use the King James that was the option of that day when they started memorizing scripture and preparing sermons, and so all their notes are in King James. Now all my manuscripts are using New American, so if I, if I want to relive it, I've got to put new scriptures in it, so to speak. And, um, and so that's, that's why. I've considered changing, but now when I change, 
uh, I better do it around Christmas time because everyone's going to be, not everyone, but there'll be probably a couple hundred wanting to, wanting to have the same version. Because when I came, I said, use whatever version you got because my version's going to be on the screen. But a lot of people still wanted to have the version I was preaching from in their hands. And so I'm, I'm aware that it will cause many people to go buy another Bible. Um, but the New American is accurate uh, and in the English Standard and King James, New King James, all of them are good word-for-word uh, translations. And, and the balanced versions are solid too. So, yes? Many years ago, a friend of mine uh, in the Navy gave me a Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary. Uh, him and his daughter came up with the idea that back in that day, the only book people had in their homes was the Bible. So he used that Bible, which happened to be King James, to teach people English. Mm. So if I didn't understand a word, I just went to the dictionary. Yeah, very good, very good. I do like the ESV. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not going to get to the back tonight, um, but on the back is the history of how we got to the Bible, the English Bibles through the Greek, through the Latin, all of that from first century to now. I do want you to know William Tyndale translated the Bible into English and he was burned to death for it. Okay, so what we take for granted, people died for. Um, there are even some groups today, though, that when they meet, um, all the reading of Scripture and their gathering is in Latin. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, when Mel Gibson made the Passion of the Christ, he went to a church where everything was spoken in Latin. I, I would do that if I agreed with it, but I don't. So I don't, you know, but that's, they want it spoken in Latin. Uh, they don't really respect the English uh, translations and, and speaking of it. So, but I can't defend that because I don't agree with it. So um, are there any... Are there any other questions? Because I'm not going to start on the history because I know I won't get, I won't get done with it. Um, I did have some I was going to say, but I've done for God now. Um, any questions? All right. Well, I hope this is helpful because I feel like many of you are often asked at birthdays or Christmas time, you know, I'm going to get a Bible. What kind of Bible should I get? Those type of things. This sheet will help you. Uh, with that, let me lead us in our closing prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for your word that is wonderful and perfect. And I thank you, Lord, that it's living not only in the Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek, which you first breathed it into existence, but also you have blessed the translations of your word. And we are so grateful for the English translation so that we can read your word and know you and worship you and adore you and praise you and know what you have done on our behalf and through human history. Lord God, give us a, an, uh, just a greater love for you and your word. It is rich, it is true, and we are so grateful for it. Lord God, move on our hearts to open your word tonight, open your word tomorrow, and saturate our minds and hearts with your truth, asking questions such as, is there a promise to claim? Is there a truth to obey? Is there a sin to confess? Lord God, bring your word to life in our lives. Help us to apply your truth to our lives that we walk in obedience to you. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.